This week on Analyzing Celebrity Faces, we take a closer look at Johnny Depp. The talented actor rose to films in his earlier roles in 21 Jump Street, so the 1987 version, and more notably in Edward Scissorhands, Pirates of the Caribbean, and Sweeney Todd, just to name a few, all of which have helped him stay relevant as a Hollywood beauty icon. What's interesting about Johnny Depp and the thing that gives him his worldwide appeal are his average proportions. While Johnny obviously doesn't look average, his proportions and ratios are almost identical to the mean proportions when averaging measurements in a group of individuals. The importance of averageness in a face was found accidentally in the 1800s by Sir Francis Galton. The English anthropologist tried to visualize a typical criminal face by creating a composite photo where he would overlay multiple images of prisoners. Surprisingly, when showing this composite to his colleagues, they unanimously agreed that the composite was more attractive than any of the constituent faces from which it diverged from. This finding later developed into the averageness hypothesis, where composite faces of a population are often more attractive than any of the individual faces from within that population itself. Another experiment tested this theory to confirm it, and as it turns out, it still holds true today. This particular experiment manipulated symmetry, averageness, and dimorphism of a face, and conducted a two alternative force choice simulation, where participants had to choose between the original or edited picture. As predicted, both the averaged and more symmetrical faces were preferred over the original. However, averaging the faces had the greatest effect on attractiveness more so than symmetry. It was discussed that this effect was due to the average face resembling mental representations of what we expect a typical face to look like. In a further study, faces that matched with these cephalometric averages actually had better gene diversity, which is correlated to better immune function. While this may seem straightforward now, it's a big part of the depth appeal and will help explain some of the coming parts. Unsurprisingly, Johnny looked best in the early 90s when he was much younger. His facial proportions and masculine features were best appreciated at a time where his face was much leaner. Splitting the face into thirds, we see that the lengths are proportional, and his lengths are ideal when compared to modern anthropometric measurements. His lower third is proportionally ideal, being slightly larger than the upper and middle thirds, which are balanced. This is to be expected on square-faced men like him, because they have stronger jaws. A slightly longer lower third with the appropriately sized jaw angle does have the effect of creating a very wide chin, which is a dimorphic masculine trait. When a face has increased lower third size, it's very important that it's in proportion. His upper lip is one third of his lower anterior facial height, while his lower lip and chin makes up two thirds. Leonardo da Vinci first noticed this in his artworks where he proposed that the one-third to two-third ratio is ideal for the lower third subdivisions. Furthermore, if you take the length of these subdivisions, the upper lip, lower lip, and chin come to 31, 27, and 41 percent respectively. This is almost exactly the proposed ideals found by Farkas et al. in his later cephalometric studies. Considering his face as a whole, he has a very aesthetic, masculine tapered jaw. Again, this is extremely common for the Hollywood look, and happens as a result of two things. One, a wide bizygomatic width, so the distance horizontally from cheekbone to cheekbone, and two, a wide bigonial width, so the distance between the two most outwardly lateral parts of the jaw. This combination with low body fat, which is essential for maximum aesthetic appeal and virility, creates a wide masculine jaw shape with a nice taper, or more accurately, an inclined OG curve. Measuring Johnny Depp's face and comparing his bizygomatic to bigonial, we see the ratio comes to be about 90%. Since the average male has a ratio of 70%, it's very clear to see why his face is so much more masculine. His ratio of 90% is again considered the ideal for aesthetics, which was discussed in detail in our video on the ideal jaw. Johnny's wide cheekbones also give him a very wide facial width to height ratio of 1.96. As discussed in the previous video, facial width to height is the ratio of face width to face height. Pretty obvious. 
This ratio is dimorphic, being higher in men, and studies have shown that higher ratios make people seem more dominant and aggressive, especially based on initial perceptions. We also note that Johnny Depp has a harmonious face, which is due to his compact midface. Taking his midface ratio, so the distance from the midpoint of the pupils to the top of the lip, we see that it is exactly one. That shows that his midface is technically a square, and everything is placed quite evenly and harmoniously. Vertically shorter, wider faces are almost always more attractive on men, and his mix of feminine softness from the eye region only helps give him the best of both worlds. Despite this, there's a nuance to Johnny Depp's appeal that's more than just a harmonious face and average proportions. In a classic study of facial attractiveness, Pereira et al. aimed to investigate if averageness was really the crucial decider of facial attractiveness. In this experiment, Pereira photographed 60 women in equal light conditions. He then made a composite of these 60, and then a composite of the 15 most attractive in that 60. Using the features of the 15 most attractive women, he created another composite of just hyper-attractive features. The findings were pretty intriguing, with the hyper-attractive composite being ranked as the most attractive, despite mathematically being the least average of the composites. Specific deviations from the average lead to increased perceptions of facial attractiveness, and these morphological patterns were dimorphic. What this means is that averageness gives you the blank canvas to draw on, there are no cosmetic or unusual defects, and dimorphically attractive features help paint the painting. Given the research, it makes sense that Johnny's appeal is not just from his averageness, but also from his prominent attractive features. One feature which Johnny Depp was known for were his hollow cheeks. Hollow cheeks are a result of prominent, high-set zygomatic bones and little buccal fat in the area between the zygoma and the mandible. We see from this three-quarter profile that Johnny Depp has a prominent OG curve as a result of a large zygomatic projection. An OG curve is an imaginary S-shaped curve which happens to curve as a result of contrast with high cheekbones tapering to the mandible and is a somewhat qualitative way of assessing cheekbone prominence. A more quantitative method to measure cheekbone size is by Powell's analysis, which indicates the most prominent part of Depp's face. The further laterally outwards the intersection of these lines, as shown in orange, the larger and further outwards the cheeks are in relation to the midface. This is important because big faces can have big cheekbones by numbers alone, but they're not always prominent because the midface is just not the right size. Moving on, Johnny's eye area is also quite masculine, but nothing unusually over the top. His eyes match the average proportions and the rule of fifths. If we were to cut his face into transverse fifths, all of these fifths are equal. This means that his eyes have equal length and are spaced ideally. Another feature are his hooded eyes. Hooded eyes are those where the upper eyelid, so the pretarsal, is often blocked out by some type of supratarsal fat. This reduces his upper eyelid exposure to the lower end of ideal at 1 to 2 millimeters. This is because the low and prominent positioning of the supraorbital rims provides support to the upper eye region and covers much of his upper eye. These hooded eyes are undeniably masculine and argued to be an adaptation to combat and hunting where they protect the eyeballs from trauma. Hooded eyes are also seen as less neotenous or juvenile as the brow ridge grows during puberty due to testosterone, so it's unlikely a child would have these features be as pronounced. Our previous video analysis of Adam Driver's face actually revealed the same features, but on an even more exaggerated scale with stronger brow bridges and brow bones that are clearly visible under the skin. Check that out after this video, and if you're enjoying the content so far, then consider subscribing to the channel. That being said, the man isn't perfect. When we look at his under eye support, we see the first floor. Johnny's infraorbital rims are quite recessed, infra or inferior referring to the lower part and orbital referring to the eye socket. This type of contour depression can manifest itself in different ways for most people, but most commonly lead to dark circles and nasodugal fat pads due to fluid and soft tissue buildup. You can even see it here where he has a permanent squint to keep his lower eyelid up due to the lack of support, the quote unquote smoldering or blue steel look. 
If you would like to learn more about these flaws, we have a full article write-up from actual doctors over at the Coos website. One form of aging, as defined by facial aesthetics and clinical diagnosis, is the loss of uniformly distributed fat. Going back to the under-eye area, had Johnny had a prominent infraorbital region, the atrophy of his fat wouldn't be as visible as there would be hard tissue under his eye. However, the absence of hard dentofacial support due to his recessed under-eye region causes the pronounced aged look. The significance of the inferior orbit or the lower eye socket in aging is often overlooked and not only do prominent infraorbitals help hide aging, but recessed ones can be mistaken for premature aging as noted by Fabio and Paolo's book on clinical facial analysis. We touched on this concept of under eye strength in our analysis of Maz Mikkelsen where his masculine eye region is part of why he has aged so gracefully. Looking for flaws on Johnny Depp's face is much harder than pointing out the positives. Researchers noted that the appeal for average faces was the absence of large discrepancies and deviations, in other words a lack of flaws. This hypothesis is consistent with Johnny's face seemingly absent of flaws because his positive features draw attention away. If we were to nitpick however, one could criticize his mouth proportions. Firstly, we see that the oral commissures or the mouth corners are not of equal lengths on both sides and drawing a horizontal line along his lips, we can see that they are not even. This is because on the right side, the high point of the vermilion, there is less vertical height compared to that of the left side. The mouth corners themselves are also not even, with the right side corner being positively tilted and the left having a negative tilt. These are very small flaws and his lips are still proportionate, with his upper to lower lip ratio being in the ideal 1 to 6. However, even this being a flaw is debatable, as mild fluctuating asymmetry is perfectly normal and interestingly enough, there have even been studies where images with perfect facial features and symmetry lost out to those with almost perfect symmetry. Lastly, we wouldn't be doing the worst pirate you've ever heard of justice if we didn't talk about his hair. He for the most part has always maintained some variation of a middle parted look. I promise the video on men's hairstyle is coming out soon, but typically men with square faced jaws look best with feminine longer hairstyles. For instance, Killian Murphy keeps his hair long offset but had it cut short in Peaky Blinders as gangsters back then did so to avoid lice. Even for someone with such a shapely head such as Killian, cutting the hair too short up to the natural part makes the face start to appear rounded and feminine all over again. So ideally, the cut should go up to the temples and no higher. Going back to depth, his middle part works best because it's a softer hairstyle on a masculine face shape. As studies have found, contrast between the face shape and hairstyle is attractive in men. Likewise, the drooping bangs also help cover aspects of his aging hairline and since he has relatively strong bone structure, his hair and face have aged quite well for someone close to 60. When his hair is pulled tightly to the sides, he doesn't have the facial masculinity in the upper third, so mainly the sharp inclination of the forehead and brow ridge to pull off the look, instead looking like a sorry Tim Burton character. Granted that John Hamm is much younger, his appearance is far more masculine than Depp's, who has more pretty boy feminine features. As explained in the skull shape video, with examples, the shape of the upper third and face shape dictate if you can pull off this swept back look, and the more angular the forehead, the better for masculinity. However, all of this aside, the main reason for his preference could just be much simpler. It's from a period in the 90s where it was the norm, and he simply stuck with the middle part because he could. Johnny Depp and the middle part is very different to a middle aged man suddenly adopting a middle part himself to hide a bald spot. Instead, it's something that works with his hairline and has grown with his style. Another analogy would be British billionaire Richard Branson, who has always kept his long flowing mane and has an even more masculine face than Depp that works with his style regardless of age. If you've enjoyed the content then please do subscribe to the channel and leave a comment down below on what you thought and who you would like to see next. If you would like for your face to be analysed and learn about your features, you can order an aesthetics report over at the Coos website.